Hello, Agnes. First of all, I want to thank you for agreeing to participate in, a, in our interview series, Talks on Higher Education. And before we begin, I just want to make a short introduction about you. Agnes Bosenkesh is Associate Professor and Director, Learning and Teaching Staff Development at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. Her focus is qualitative research in critical university studies and changing academic roles and identities. With a background in cultural studies, she uses critical theories and creative methodologies to explore questions concerning power relations, discourses and practices of inclusion and exclusion, locations of knowledge and constructions of subjectivity. And she has written many interesting and numerous articles and papers in, on these subjects. So Agnes, let's begin. My first question is the following. As a feminist scholar who has written much on uh, women in higher education, what do you think, what are the main challenges for women in academia? And what is or are causing these challenges? So look, I have thought about the main challenges for women in academia. And I think the comment I have is one that is, uh, is an international view. It's true across many, many countries. And that is the major challenge for women is career progression in academia and representation at leadership levels in higher education. I can speak from my own context, which is in Australia. And Australia um, has prides itself on doing quite well in terms of uh, gender equity, but at associate professor and professor levels, we only have about a quarter of um, professors are women. So there is uh, progress that has been made that has improved over the last couple of decades, but uh, it's only improving at approximately um, a percentage point per year. So it's, it's slow progress. I do know in other countries, progress is even slower. So where in Australia um, and many countries, there's good participation by women as university students, undergraduate and postgraduate, many women in a lower level academic roles, we have a problem at those higher levels. So I would say in a nutshell, those are the main challenges for women in academia. Thank you. Um, okay. uh, personal question, if I may. Uh, what was the most uh, serious challenge for you as a woman in academia, Agnes? And how have you confronted these challenges? So, it, you know, um, my whole approach as a feminist scholar is, is based on personal experience. I was a part-time academic for 12 years as I was raising my children. So the biggest challenge for me, I would say, has been combining motherhood and academia and being promoted during that process. I would add that my parenting experience uh, involved a child with a chronic illness and um, a lot of time spent in hospital and in um, with medical professionals, and that had a particular in impact on interrupting my career. So my youngest child is now nine. So that does free things up in terms of being able to participate more in the workforce. But it's relatively uncommon to be part-time for such a long period of time in academia. And you certainly notice impacts on research productivity, the types of projects you can be involved in and career progression. So that has been a challenge and I feel very fortunate that I have had the support I've had from my institution, from colleagues, from managers and family to be able to progress my career in the way I have. So I would say that these challenges are very much systematic challenges. They're not things that individuals can um, manage alone. They're um, challenges that require a systemic approach to supporting women's career participation. And I think this also benefits men in academia, where they can also take parental leave and have interrupted careers for because of caring responsibilities, illness, any other reasons, and continue to maintain career trajectory. Well, you're right, the support is very important, very important. 
Well, uh, recently, as you know, I have been participating in the online meetings, Flow Academia, critical discussion, led by you, and which were organized under the framework of philosophy and theory of higher education society. By the way, I enjoyed these meetings very much. And you are also running a blog called the Slow Academic. So I have two questions. Uh, first, what is a slow academia and why is it important? And the second, what was the reason you started to write a blog? So you mentioned the, the Paths seminar series on slow academia, a critical discussion. I think that goes to the heart of um, my interest in slow academia in that it's something that has been talked about a great deal as a response to the challenges of having an academic career, the fast paced work, the constant um, need to focus on outputs, um, grant income, maintaining a certain pace of work. And a lot of the work that's been written about slow academia has focused on how we just manage that busyness and the constant performativity and metricization of academic work. I um, wanted to think in that series about how we think about the th philosophy and theory of academic work and how that can invite us to think about slow academia. My approach to slow academia and my understanding of it is very much a personal one. I mentioned um, parenting a child with chronic illness and being part-time. And it was once I was more secure in my work, I went through the usual sorts of uh, universities restructures that resulted in changed work conditions. Once I was more secure in my role and I felt I had time and space and energy to write about academia as I was experiencing it, that's when I started a blog. And I was really interested in that experience of academia, um, the changing nature of it, the, the pressure to perform, the, the meritocracy of academia. I was interested in the politics of institutions and really thinking about that, that work of activism where people try to shape academia to be a space that works well for them. So that was when I started blogging because I had, I, I'm a very avid reader of blogs and listener of two of podcasts. And I was looking for something that I thought I'd like an investigation into these ideas of um, what it is to do academic work in a slower way. You know, what, where can I fit myself in? If I'm a part-time person, who doesn't see myself as able to keep up with others, is there a space in academia for me? And I started blogging to create that space and connect with others. Yes, these, these spaces which, you know, slow you down, I think are very important because in this epoch of when the rashness and swiftness and it's, in, I think, very important to slow down. Yeah, yes, thanks. And uh, in connection with this, in one of your papers, you mentioned the notion of uh, slow, tiny acts of resistance. Well, that is, actions which are directed against a contemporary neoliber neoliberal ideology in academia, which uh, tries to measure everything, research, output, university rankings, etc. Well, uh, in the same article, it is also mentioned, you mentioned it, that for you, one of the slow, tiny acts of resistance was exploration of measures of success and productivity that resist the values of neoliberal academia in the quote. Well, can you tell us a little bit about these alternative ways of defining what it is to be an academic? So first I should note that this idea of slow tiny acts of resistance um, came from the work of Barbara Grant from the University of Auckland. And she spoke about that in a podcast. She calls them stars. And I thought that's a really useful name for um, finding ways to clarify what it meant to, uh, to resist that work of everything having to be counted and measured and performed against. You know, that sense of, I think for many people, um, that idea of going into academia because it gives us space for things we enjoy like, reading, thinking, writing, 
having conversations with colleagues and with students, the deep work of learning and intellectual challenge. I think so many of those things don't happen quickly. You know, you don't say, oh, you know, my conversation was better because we had it really quickly. Or I was able to read that so fast, I enjoyed it more. Or my thinking is better when I think really quickly. I think it's the the time taken to do these things slowly and thoughtfully. That's what I really enjoy about academic work. So I do often think about um, that notion of playing the game and the game of having to be um, counted. And that's something that's many people have written about across multiple countries and the experience of having to um, go through these sorts of processes. The, I think for me, the alternative way of thinking about an academic, being an academic, is to focus on um, what Barbara Grant and colleagues wrote about when they talked about the infinite game of universities. And the infinite game is the stuff that you, you want to be remembered for, the stuff that you want to keep doing that you think serves a higher purpose um, that is not of just individual benefit, but is a collective good. You know, so I don't think there are many people who would be on their deathbed and think, if only I had applied for more grants or published more journal articles. The thing pe things people focus on are the relationships with others and their closeness and the things that enrich you. So I've really tried to explore how um, these slow, tiny acts of resistance allow me to think about what my values are, to do the work required to um, contribute to academia, but to make it a place that I think values the things that a lot of people are there for and take a, a more infinite view of our purpose. Well, this infinite game is a very interesting and deep notion indeed. Uh, I'm going to send the last question and a kind of different one uh, about the local context. Well, sometimes in Georgia, my country, feminism is equated with radical feminism and is seen as an expression of hatred toward men. Uh, and according to your opinion, what is the main message of feminism? And how feminism can help to overcome the challenges mentioned in the first question? women face in academia? And can we, male and female academics together, based on our shared humanity, be partners in this difficult process of overcoming these challenges and be uh, partners rather than you know, enemies or irreducible others? And if it is possible, how is it possible? So look, I should, I should say I love men. I am, you know, a daughter, wife, sister, mother to men and boys. I have wonderful male colleagues and mentors and friends, and I'm a feminist. So I absolutely believe that you can be feminist and, um, and not have hatred towards men at all. You know, and I think, and I think the men in my life, many of them are feminists as well. So for me, the main message of, of feminism and, and promoting feminism is respecting diversity and promoting inclusivity. So the very values that I want in academia are the same values that I want to raise my children with. You know, that, that respect for others, the value of community and connection, being an ethical person, um, thinking about social reform and how we can make the world a better place in many ways. And um, in academia, I'm, I've been particularly interested in how we integrate the work of academia and also care works, which for me has been a very important part of my experience as an academic, because it wasn't always a friendly place to be where you had other things that were more important, like a child in hospital or, you know, you couldn't always negotiate university processes easily or contribute what you needed to or be successful. So the values um, that are part of my feminism are also kind of the core values of what I think, um, what I think slow academia is about as well. 
and you know really are my core values for living so the challenges I raised around representation of women in leadership levels of the university is really about and you know I'd like to say that I think that that's important it's not just the um, representation of women at those levels but it's representation of all the sorts of intersections of difference of people who are part of the university and part of the communities that the university serves. So having leadership that represents who the people are, I think really goes a long way to demonstrating what diversity and inclusion look like at a structural level. Because one of the challenges I had, this is a really practical example, when um, my daughter was born and was very ill as a baby, I worked part time and I was told that I couldn't have, I couldn't take carer's leave. We had quite a generous provision, a high number of hours of carer's leave we were entitled to, but I was told I wasn't allowed to use it for her medical appointments because I was making appointments and I should make them on the days I wasn't working. Now, when the, when the professor at the children's hospital says to me, I want you to come to an appointment on such and such a day. I just said, yes. I don't say, hold on, that's not a day, you know, that's a day I'm at work. Can you make it at 5 p.m. on Friday night instead? Because the professor of medicine at the children's hospital doesn't, doesn't negotiate that way. So I was able to say to the university, this is unfair and it's detrimental to women who are carers in particular. And they revised that policy. They said, you're right people should be able to use their carer's leave for medical appointments that whoever they're caring for requires. So it's circumstances like that that I think benefits everyone across the university. It benefits anyone who has a sick partner, is sick themselves, has elderly parents, um, all benefit from a change in policy that recognises you can't always just make the medical appointments at a time convenient for you you're part of the larger hospital system and you go with their temporality. So I think um, the it really is a shared process of making university leadership more representative and making inclusion a practice that we all enact every day. And I think um, it's certainly not something that can be undertaken where people are in opposition to one another. There has to be a shared vision of a more respectful and inclusive environment and the benefit of these for our students, for our family members, for ourselves and our own well-being, I think makes it valuable collective work. Thank you. I think this dimension of care which you have emphasized is very important, especially in the face of global pandemic, because pandemics doesn't uh, differentiate between men and women, it affects everyone, so we need to Unite. We need to think about our this common shared humanity and care about each other in order to realize uh, those prospects which will improve our, our societies in the future. Because possibilities are open and some possibilities are bad, but some possibilities are better. And I think we should unite, unite in order to realize these better possibilities which are in ourselves. So, thank you, Agnes. Thank you so much for your very interesting answers on my questions and I hope that thank you for the questions they were challenging good challenging questions to think with and very good and thought-provoking answers so thank you thank you